Despite minor glitches, the Sochi Olympics started and ended with a bang. While the athletes competed for gold, the analysts look for signs of how Russia performed outside the arena. What do Sochi Olympics tell us about Russia today in terms of politics, human rights and its aspirations as a country? Find out next on The Line. This is On The Line and I'm Aisha Tansin. Now that the snow has settled in Sochi and the gold is safely tucked away, it's time to reflect on what these Olympics demonstrated about Russia today. Our guests will help us understand why these gains were so important to President Vladimir Putin and whether our understanding of Russia has changed or solidified as a result of these games. Our first guest is Sufyan Zhemakov. He's the co-author of an upcoming book titled The 2014 Winter Olympics and the Evolution of Putin's Russia. The book will be out in September. Our second guest is joining us via Skype from Zurich, Switzerland. Martin Müller is the head of Swiss National Science Foundation Research Unit at the University of Zurich. Welcome to On The Line. Uh, Dr. Zhemakov, starting with why these games were so imp important to President Vladimir Putin, we don't really see presidents take such a personal interest in Olympic Games. Exactly. Russia uh, is a new state and it's kind of building its own statehood after the fall of Soviet Union, but still Russians see themselves as uh, they have legacy of Soviet Union and want to match the achievements of Soviet era. And so for Putin, uh, it is, the Sochi Olympics are symbolic because they kind of match 1980s uh, Moscow Olympics. So, so given that background, Dr. Mueller, what was it that President Putin set out to do with these Olympics? What was he trying to show to the world? But more importantly, what was he trying to show to Russians? Or was it there something that he was trying to prove to himself? Well, he certainly wanted to show to the world that Russia is not only a state with a big nuclear arsenal, not only a state with big oil and gas resources, but a state that could just as well compete um, uh, on the international level in areas such as tourism, which are much more sexier and much more attractive, something that's called soft power. And that's also the same reason um, what uh, drove him to host the Games internally, to communicate to the Russian public, uh, look, uh, we are being recognized internationally. People actually envy us that we have the Olympic Games. But okay. I think there's also then a second agenda that one needs to see, and that is the distribution of resources that is central to the Olympic Games in Sochi, and that also helps him to keep the country running. Okay, so given what the president set out to do, uh, Mr. Zemokov, do you think he achieved his goals? One of uh, the major problems that uh, this authoritarian or semi-authoritarian regime has, it's legitimacy and so uh, for Putin it was important kind of that uh, this big show this big mega project would back up his legitimacy and uh, many people were doubting that uh, this in many uh, ways in security economics Russia will be able to do it but at the end we saw that uh, what we could see on the TV screens was quite good and so I think uh, Putin achieved what he wanted. Uh, he didn't achieve what he declared everything. Like if I would measure, I would say he achieved 10% of what he declared. But I think he achieved what he wanted. So a lot of pomp and show, and we'll go into detail of what he declared and, and de decide whether, uh, you know, ask you whether he achieved that or not. Uh, but Mr. Mueller, $51 billion, the most expensive Olympics in the history of Olympics, in this era of global economic meltdown, uh, if this had happened in a Western nation, there'd be a big hue and cry. What is the reaction in Russia? Well, the re reaction certainly is that people have taken notice of this massive amount of money that is being spent, and people view it critically. But they nevertheless still support the Olympic Games. There is a small majority, but still a majority of people in Russia support the Olympic Games, which is partly to do also with uh, the 
feeling that in Russia, the notion of taxpayers' money is not as established as it would be in the United States or in Western Europe. And so for a lot of Russians, it means that the government is doing something, the government is putting on a show, a show and that doesn't have much to do with us. Coming back to what you said, uh, Dr. Zhamokhov, about what uh, President Putin set out to do, he made a lot of declarations when he pitched these games. These games were going to be environmentally uh, carbon neutral, they were ecologically friendly, they were going to be respect for human rights. So let's talk about what Russia promised, promised and what Russia delivered. In terms of environment, what was the record? In terms of environment, uh the Olympic uh, candidature file uh, stated that this will be the most green Olympics uh, in the world history and that was completely not delivered. Uh, they uh, claimed that the Olympic would cost only 12 billion dollars. That wasn't delivered. They said that uh, there will be 250,000 uh, jobs created for migrants and uh, immigrant workers and uh, officially there was only 12,000 jobs created and there were a lot of abuses uh, among so, migrant workers. So let's go to one, uh, each of them one by one. Environmentally, uh, some environmental activists were also jailed. What was it that they were pointing out that was so horrendous at least to, the, to Kremlin that they were put behind bars? It's not that the Kremlin didn't want to deliver all that and it's not that, for example, uh, Kremlin didn't uh, initiate dialogues with environmentalists. In 2007 and 2008, there were a lot of meetings and Putin pers personally met with uh, ecologists. But then both sides realized that uh, they uh, can't uh, cooperate with each other and the regime, the organizers, got more and more irritated uh, that uh, ecologists would point uh, the problems uh, of ecology. Because, for example, they built these tunnels, four big tunnels, which uh, completely changed the environment of the region because now the hot uh, air is going to those places. And, for example, in a couple of years, we may see completely different uh, weather there. And not talking about pollution, not talking about uh, bad ecology, that alone, they, they changed it on very, very big scale. Uh, Dr. Muller, um, and I want to touch on all of these subjects briefly. Uh, let's talk about human rights. How was the record? Did Russia restrain itself in terms of human rights uh, during the Olympics, before the Olympics? or uh, did we see more crackdown? I think we saw more crackdown, although Russia had a, quite a clever move when it came to hosting the actual Olympics. They designated a separate protest zone in which people could protest. Uh, the only uh, problem being that it was far removed from any of the Olympic action, so none of the media actually ever turned out to be at the protest zone simply because it was not conveniently located. Before the Olympic Games, we've definitely seen crackdown, although in, in subtle ways. So it was not always the case that uh, people were, that violence was applied against protesters, but they, they were bullied, bullied in other ways, for example, prosecuted, uh, tax inspectors coming in, fire inspectors coming in. Uh, so there were more subtle, subtle mechanisms of um, suppressing public protest. Okay, so we're talking about ecology, we're talking about human rights. Let's talk about... Uh Russia's image on the world stage. Do you think that uh, President Putin uh, delivered on that? Whatever he promised to Russians that Russia was going to be after the Olympics, is it that today? Well, I think one of the ways to exceed somebody's expectation is to lower somebody's expectation at first. So everybody actually expected that uh, Putin and uh, the organizers of the Olympics will fail uh, on some of those issues. They won't, either won't uh, build the facilities on time or they, they will be security issues. So with those low expectations, I think Russia exceeded everybody's expectations and uh, Putin, Putin delivered the message that he wanted. And security was going to be a huge issue, wasn't it, Dr. Mueller? Uh, there were threats 
um, by some militant organizations. People thought there might have might be terrorist attacks, but Russia avoided that. Yes, it, it did avoid that uh, quite successfully. So, but also with a massive presence, also a massive visual presence, if you were there, of uh, security personnel, um, both military soldiers and uh, policemen. Um, so it came at the cost of, uh, you know, great, great, great uh, security measures and significant security measures uh, that infringed on, on people's personal freedom. I think that's the trade-off that you need to see. But I think you have the trade-off with almost any mega event of that size. Now, we're talking about what Russia was able to deliver or not deliver in terms of Sochi, and we will continue talking about that. But one thing I'm very interested in finding out is it was a window for the outside world, Dr. Zhemokhov, on what Russia today is, the post-Soviet Union Russia. What did we learn about Russia in terms of, uh, for example, its politics and how things operate? What did we learn? Well, it is uh, like facade of uh, Putin's Russia, that's uh, how you can see it. And uh, I think the world saw that behind this facade, Russia is not uh, a successful modern country that uh, could be member of a global community because there are problems with democracy, there are problems with economy, with security, and uh, if you analyze the coverage that Russia uh, received in Western media, you can say that uh, it was mostly negative. Uh, Dr. Mueller, wouldn't you say, though, and some Russians might say that this is exactly what happens in Western media. Russia or any country that they don't look upon as a friendly country is always given negative coverage, that there are problems with democracy in other countries. There is a, a general Russophobia in, in Western countries. But I think in this case with the Olympic Games, you just need to look at the fact. And, uh, and if you look at the facts and present them, a lot of Russians will agree in private if you talk to them that yes, this definitely went uh, way across, uh, way over what it should have been, and that a lot of things went, uh, went very wrong. Um, so when you say a lot of things w went very wrong, when you, ha when you put it in, in a scale, do you think more was achieved or less was achieved, more went wrong? I think more went wrong than was actually achieved. And I think, I mean, coming back to your question, what did Putin want to show and was he successful in doing so? Of course he wanted to show that he's the man in charge, he is uh, uh, the, the, the stronghold of power. And at first glance, it appears uh, pretty much to be the case, and that's what a lot of the Western media in particular reported. But I think if you look more closely, you see that the facade that um, uh, Sufyan Jimkhov was talking about is crumbling, really, because um, he's not as powerful as he wants us to believe. And I think the, the cost overrun that you had by more than four times, so initially projected to be 12 million, now $51 billion, um, from 12 billion to 51 billion dollars, I mean, that's definitely a sign that not all things are working according to the plans that Putin had designed initially. But it's going, uh, Mr. Zhemokhov, from 12 to 51 because in Sochi they had to build almost 85 percent of the infrastructure from the ground up, unlike in other cities where a lot of times there's some infrastructure already there. Yes, when they uh, applied for holding the Olympics. Uh, Back in 2007, uh, they, uh, it was understood that everything is in, was included in $12 uh, billion. But then, in a couple of years, they understood that uh, it's impossible for them to build it uh, with $12 uh, billion. And it is common for all the Olympics. They usually uh, declare less money and uh, overrun their budgets. But uh, then they decided to kind of split the cost and uh, to apply the biggest cost, uh, biggest uh, spending to infrastructure of Sochi while they said that uh, they even, the last figure that Putin announced was uh, $6.7 billion that was spent on the Olympics. So uh, in uh, his view, uh, they even spent less than they uh, uh, Declared. Then they declared. I want to continue talking about that and I also want to talk about what these Olympics show us about Russia's potential, but we need to take a short break here. We'll be right back.
Voice of America. 1,500 hours of news and information. Educational and cultural programming to more than 134 million people worldwide each week. Listen to us on radio. Watch us on television. Follow us on Facebook or Twitter. And through your mobile device. VOA. We're dynamic and consistent in bringing you the most reliable information in 43 languages. Tune in. Tune in. Welcome back to On the Line. I'm Aisha Tanzim. We're talking about Sochi Olympics and what they taught us about present-day Russia. Our guests are Sufyan Zhemukhov, the co-author of an upcoming book titled The 2014 Winter Olympics and the Evolution of Putin's Russia, and Martin Mueller, the head of Swiss National Science Foundation Research Unit at the University of Zurich. Let's talk about what Russia learned from these Olympics. There was a give, uh, Mr. Zemokhov, on some issues. Uh, even though it was far away, there was an area for protesters. There was an effort e at the beginning to do things environmentally. Uh, what did Russia take away from these Olympics in terms of being part of a global community? Well, uh, I would, uh, it, it just occurred to me that uh, the organizers failed to deliver almost everything that they promised but they delivered something they didn't, that they didn't promise. They, the, from the beginning, they never promised that they will win most of the medals, but they, they achieved that. So it, 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 is, it was a very strong message uh, to uh, Russians. It was uh, a festivity. But in terms of uh, what uh, Russians learned from it, they just learned that the current regime's course will not change. Uh, it will be, uh, as it was, uh, rather hard uh, on human rights issues, corruption and uh, all other uh, problems, while at the same time there will be these uh, facades, these shows, uh, like uh, the small areas designated for protests uh, where nobody, no media can go uh, there will be some uh, freedom allowed but controlled. There will be s some gestures made like letting uh, Mikhail Khodorkovsky out, but at the same time it will never stop uh, arresting other uh, people and putting uh, uh, people into jail for political reasons. So uh, people learned that nothing changed actually. Uh, Mr. Mueller, do you agree with Mr. Zhemukhov that Russians learned that Kremlin's way is the way? Or do you think that they took something away from this? I, I think that they pretty much saw that the, the Kremlin could deliver on what it said it would deliver. And um, I think what they're taking away is that uh, it's also a certain measure of pride that Russia can actually organize uh, mega events of that size. And of course, Russia is looking towards organizing the uh, Football World Cup in 2018, the Soccer World Cup, and that's something that a lot of Russians will now be looking forward to. Now, tell me what these Olympics showed us about Russia's political system. Very top-down from what I understand, but do, do you see any changes over the last one decade? Uh, one thing that uh, this Olympics uh, supposed to show actually to the world is how Russia's uh, uh, political system designed. Uh, they call it in Russia manual managing. Mm -hmm. So everything uh, that is uh, of some significance is managed personally by the first uh, uh, person, by Putin. So uh, while in uh, other Olympics the leaders of the state usually don't work so much on Olympics, here Putin for the last year, since last February, he announced that he was working on Olympics on a daily basis. So that's how the whole country actually managed, and that's uh, what uh, the Westerners could see. Do you think this is going to uh, solidify Putin's grip on Russia, Mr. Mueller, or is it going to weaken it, given that he's come out as this control freak? 
I think he's, he, he's bought himself some time and the major issue is going to be the slowing economic growth. So Sochi was massively expensive. The resources to distribute are getting fewer and fewer. And uh, with economic growth being forecast somewhere between 2 and 3% for the next years to come, uh, the question is where will he get the money from to keep the system running as it has been running for the past years, especially with a lot of big projects still in the pipeline. And the World Cup 2018 is, is one of them. Uh, so here's the question then, Mr. Shamukhov. Going into the Olympics, you as an expert on Russia and somebody who keeps an eye on it, did you expect all of this or was some of it uh, even worse or better than what you expected? Uh, the achievements of Russian athletes uh, was much better than uh, I expected, uh, but I'm not an expert on sport. Uh, apart from that, uh, Probably security uh, issues were handled better than I expected, but pretty much every, everything else uh, was uh, as bad as I expected. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mueller, do you think these Olympics are an indication of where Russia wants to go from here in terms of its place on the international stage? Well, uh, I don't hope so because it would mean to, to say one thing and, and do the other and that would uh, imply a fundamentally dishonest attitude. Uh, but I, I, I fear that it might be the sort of things that we will see in the future uh, from Russia where facade uh, counts a lot more than, than actual reality and what is being done and there's a very strong disconnect between rhetoric on the one hand and, and actual practice on the other. But it did show itself as a big player, didn't it? Mr. It did, and it, it, it successfully also, um, and, and you definitely have to give credit where credit is, is due. It successfully organized the Olympic Games, it successfully hosted the Olympic Games. So if we take these 16 days, which a lot of people look at, I definitely agree that um, Russia made a, a very strong showing there. But I think we need to take the period before that and the period after that into account. And I think that's where the big problems are with cost overruns, with long-term use, with crackdown on human rights, and with uh, uh, really not delivering on the promises that were made. Well, thank you very much. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today. I want to thank our guest, Sufyan Jemukhov, the co-author of an upcoming book titled The 2014 Winter Olympics and the Evolution of Putin's Russia, and Martin Muller, the head of Swiss National Science Foundation Research Unit at the University of Zurich. And thank you for joining us. Please send us your questions or comments or watch our past shows on our website, voanews.com slash on the line. We look forward to hearing from you and hope you'll join us again next week for another episode of On The Line. My childhood home is in one of Miami's poorest neighborhoods. I was shy, and art was my escape. When I saw Revelations, it inspired me. Alvin Ailey said it best, dance comes from the people and should always be delivered back to the people. I work hard because I believe that I owe that to the people who have helped me along the way. To me, Black History Month celebrates what's at the heart of my dance company, and that is the uniqueness of the African-American culture in this country. My name is Robert Battle, and I'm the Artistic Director of the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. This could make up the tissue transplant of the future, at least in Gabriel Villar's wild scientific fantasies. <laughs> a lot of scientists don't like wild fantasies in papers, so, so we had to be a little bit cautious in our wording. But um, in principle, these things, they should be able to mimic pretty much any tissue because any cell is essentially a, a little bag of water. And these are little water bags too. This is a network of tiny water droplets coated in oil. The oil makes them stick together and they can be chemically engineered to work in concert, like this. Part of Villar's innovation was making this machine to fabricate the pseudocellular networks. So what you're seeing there is actually two nozzles. And each one of those is a really thin glass tube, just about the size of a human hair. We have these glass tubes immersed in oil. You can't tell that the oil is there because it's transparent. 
And we have a little droplet generator at the other end of each of those tubes. As soon as the droplet leaves the tube, it's coated by the oil the tubes are submerged in. Because of that oil... The droplets actually stick together. They actually kiss and um, become joined by a very, very thin membrane. Uh, it's only five nanometers, so it's actually just a couple of molecules thick. But it's, it's strong enough to prevent the droplets from falling under gravity, so you can really build objects up with 90 degree walls, and actually you can make them slope away. That oil membrane has another function. It's a lipid bilayer, just like a cell wall. And like a cell wall, it lets water pass through. That allows these bubbly blobs to change shape if you adjust the salt concentration in the different droplets. The, the first thing we tried was actually um, planar strip, kind of like a, a strip of bacon, in which one side, if you like, the, the fat of the bacon was uh, very watery, and then uh, the other side was very salty. And we found that watery droplets give uh, the water to the salty droplets. The watery droplets get smaller, the salty ones get bigger. And the whole thing curls up into a circle. Uh, we've actually shown that you can get them to do mechanical work, you can get them to push little things around. Publishing online in Science this week, Villar and colleagues also showed that the droplets can be engineered to carry electrical signals by passing charged particles from one droplet to another, which would come in handy if you're making synthetic tissues that need to carry nerve signals, for example. Now, if you're thinking, this doesn't look much like an organ. You're right, though. At the moment, they don't look very much like organs or tissues. So organs are yet another level of complexity, but um, you could imagine getting a scratch on your skin and needing some kind of protective layer. Okay, maybe it's the band-aid of the future. For Science Friday, I'm Flora Lichtman. The wind in wide open Wyoming can be brutal, but instead of cursing it, power companies are harnessing this nearly constant supply of clean energy. As these wind farms grow and expand, they're going to need trained technicians, folks that understand the particulars about why this turbine does what it does. Run the studs all the way in and then get the nuts and go every other one. With help from the National Science Foundation, Laramie County Community College in Cheyenne has expanded its technical training with a program in wind energy. Program director John Lamori says there's heavy focus on safety and teamwork like these drills. Okay, here Brent's going to perform a ladder rescue on a victim that is either unconscious or hurt on the ladder. Brandon is going to demonstrate self-evacuation in the event, for example, if there was a fire and you needed to escape rapidly and you couldn't go back inside. It's very exciting to do this because you actually know that you could be doing this in real life or using this stuff to save somebody. Students are put to the test early on to see if they can handle 300 foot heights. Two weeks into the program, we come out here to the Happy Jack Wind Farm. We have the students all outfitted with their personal protective equipment and we climb a turbine for the first time. They're motivated afterwards, they really like it. Wind power adds energy flexibility to a state already known for coal and oil resources. And we think that uh, with the federal government's push on, on renewable and alternative energy sources, we have an opportunity to help our citizens understand what wind energy means to the state. In the United States, renewable energy has often been at the mercy of changing political winds. But non-traditional students believe this is a career with a future. Once I got laid off, I really had to sit down and look at what is it that I wanted to do and what's going to be a business is, is still going to be around because a lot of high tech has moved. So I was part of a government retraining program. Basically, I just love to climb things. And when this job came along, I thought, what better place to work than 300 feet off the, off the ground? With students from across the country and a waiting list for enrollment, things may be looking up for wind power. For Science Nation, I'm Miles O'Brien.